felt bad I wasn't able to do it Sunday. Buddy Ken. Hey Chester, how you doing, buddy? Great, what's you? Oh, I can't complain. Well, what happened to uh, C? She goes into the uh, auditorium with uh, my mother-in-law, her mom. Do you just take notes only in class? Are you taking it in service too? Uh, no, I don't take them in service. I have in the past, but I haven't lately. Uh, do, the, do, do the questions in the, in the uh, class. I love it, but my body's good. What kind of work do you do again? I work with Bill Cottle, Mountain uh, Water Field. Whole house, old water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Saban was in town today. <laughs> was he? <laughs> yeah. Who was he recruiting today? Well, there's SEC days are over at the uh, College Hall of Fame, so he was in town. It's not quite the frenzy that it was in Birmingham. Probably not. I'm talking about for him. Oh, for him. Although they, they said there were some people over there waiting for him. <laughs> then in Florida, the Alabama, Florida, and I think Mississippi State were on, on the docket today. How long does it go? Uh, all this week. Are you going to it? No, no, no. Yeah, okay. I got better things to do in the middle of the day. Is it pretty hot when you work out? You work out hot in the heat. It is really hot. <laughs> you like that type of work? It's okay. I guess you get an air conditioned van and drive around. Process he has for captains. I still think we should have to take his test. <clears throat> It'll make these little pre class questions seem simple. Have you ever seen the test they used to take in the eighth grade back in the 40s? It's unbelievable what they had to do. Wow. You didn't pay for an exit row, so you didn't get a 
You can get an extra life ring. Fight last week, the people in the extra row only spoke Spanish, and I was a crowd over next to them, and it was the aisle. But for whatever reason, the fight attendant, since she didn't speak Spanish, they could ask them and they have them respond properly. She asked someone in the row behind me, if he wanted to switch. He also didn't speak English, but he was able to. Good students. He was able to, like, uh, figure it out, make it seem like he did. So he got the exit row. I got stuck still, not the exit row. Oh, you know, well, there's some there's some Delta Comfort seats up here. Let's say upgrade. Yeah, and we have increased the size of the bathroom in here. Oh, wait a minute, we have. Hello, <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. How do we think? Bring it in. Bring it in. Hello, oh, Teresa. <coughs> Hi, Chester. In there causing trouble again, huh? How are you? I'm fine, Chester. How are you? Great. Yeah, for a moment, I thought you were like a co teacher or something in there. You yeah. were hiding out from this class. <laughs> I'm just trying to get them ready for Sunday. Do they have the honor of having you as a teacher? Unfortunately, they do. <laughs> Hello. Hello, how are you doing? Chester doing good. Here Sunday, <coughs> these questions should look relatively familiar. If you weren't, but you read the material, it might look still somewhat familiar. And if you haven't done either one, it probably looks a little strange. So. We'll get started in about 30 seconds. <coughs> All right, I'm going to take these off. We're going to move ahead to the title of the class. If you haven't figured out what we're studying by now, it's a little too late. This is the last class, 13. And uh, I see Blaine outside. It almost looks like he's already changing maps and stuff. So we may, I would imagine the bulletin tonight will show what the next classes are. See about that? We're done with this one after tonight. Um, you remember, I actually put some titles to these last two classes uh, beyond just saying Upward Purpose of the Church, Part 1, Part 2. We talked on Sunday about declaring God's glory. And we're going to look at some of the things that we do in worshiping God uh, tonight. We should have really have already covered the Lord's Supper on Sunday. We didn't get to it. So we'll just start from there and we'll talk about different things that we do in worship and why we do them and how we do them as kind of the final class here. That may give you a little bit of a clue of, of the questions we asked before, but I'm going to take it off. We'll come back to that. If you remember on these goals, I don't know if we've stressed these enough or not. Maybe sometimes it's not good to always come back to them in every single class. But for the last number of classes, we've been trying to emphasize these last two, especially as we got into the latter half of our material focus more on the three purposes uh, of the church, uh, the way, at least the way we've defined it, an inward and outward and upward purpose of the church. It seems to me that these two goals in particular relate to those. And tonight, I hope to show you as we, we go through some of the things that we do in worship, 
it may not be that those are um, is absolute. We must do them, and we must do them that way, as you may think that they are. I think it may be that they're a little more tied to this goal of pleasing God and being confident that doing it that way and doing it as often as we do and doing the things that we do, there's no question that God would be pleased by that. And as a result, why would we do something else? Maybe driving more of some of these acts and how we do them than anything else. And so that one's um, very important to have highlighted. A lot of what we do as a group here is driven by our intention and desire, hopefully, to please God. And if that this class has helped strengthen your desire to do that, then I think it's been successful for you in terms of the 13 lessons. And then the last one, we've been talking about different ways that we could be a more active member here and broken it into these three purposes. And, of course, we're focused on the upward purpose, and so we have some things there about uh, being more active and faithful and honoring God and worshiping. Now, if that didn't help give you some idea, at least part of answering these two questions, uh, then, then you weren't prepared for the questions because they were up there. Like, some of the information was already in those last couple of slides. So what do you think? In your words, how would you describe? What is the upward purpose, the way we've tried to describe it in this class? Pleasing God. Well, uh, pleasing God is an important thing, but is that... Is that the way we describe the upward purpose? What would, you, what would you say? What do we? You can have another word, a synonym, even for it if you want. Worship. It, it is certainly a big part of that. That whole idea of it's an upward focus. We come together on Sunday as an entire church. Come together tonight. We're going to do some things later on uh, intended to worship God. What do we mean by worship? What do you what do you think we have in mind with that? Praise. Him. Praise is 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 a word we'll see kind of come up in preaching. these things. Should I try to hear you? Preaching. Well, that may be an act, but what do we mean by worship itself? That is one way that that may be done. There's an honoring of God. So there's this focus, this praise. I I, I think of thankfulness. In expressing gratitude. There's an, there's there are statements we make toward God. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that. All of that's this this upward language you meant to say. I was going to say expression of love. Yeah. And when we talked on Sunday morning, we really didn't get into worship as much as we got into the idea of glorifying God. And y'all have been talking about honoring God. So this question here, maybe you can help me out a little bit. Two ways we as a church accomplish this upward call. This is what we're here Sunday. What would you say? We talked about being the kind of people that would be pleasing God in our actions and in our hearts. Okay. And so if, if, if we are what we are supposed to be, how is that connected to this upward purpose? A little obscure question, but Katie? I mean, I'm thinking if when we, from the perspective of a visitor, like they're, they're going, our, our behavior will tell a story which will point to glorify God. Yeah, and I'm going to go back to that slide where we listed all of those things that a visitor ought to observe if they came here, if we were doing what we're supposed to. And as a result of all of them as a whole, if we were doing every one of those, it makes a statement about God. You, you might think at first, well, it just makes a statement about us, but it doesn't. The, the church makes a statement about God. You think of a passage even that talks about the idea that the church is making a statement about God. First Corinthians 14. Okay, well, that's a chapter on worship. So what verse, do you, you have a specific verse in mind about? I don't, I don't just, just the way you conduct yourself to the outsiders. And, uh, yeah, what they would see and perceive as a yeah. result of that. Right. Yeah. You, you may remember a passage. You're welcome to look back if you have Lesson 12 with you, uh, to a passage we looked at where the church is, something is known to a group through the church. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3.10. And, it, and it, it's not just simply that. In fact, there is something talking about being known to other people. We'll talk about how it, it is. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about a visitor getting an impression. 
But who actually learns something about God through the church, according to Ephesians 3, verse 10? Yeah. You know, the, the power is beyond, and we, we can't even see and, 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 and know directly. Those powers are um, struck by God's wisdom and God's might, as we looked at an earlier chapter in Ephesians, because of what God has accomplished within the church. And specifically, in that passage in Ephesians 3, in the verses right before it, and in chapter 2 as well, what was that mystery, that thing that was not understood up until the time of Christ and then men went out to preach about Him. What was the mystery that's connected with the church people didn't know about before but now has been told clearly? How are all, how are all equal? Yes, we're all equal. And particularly in those days. Gentiles and Jews. Yeah, they, that, that the church be made up of both. The, the, the middle wall of partition was broken down. Everybody is part of this one body. And that kind of unity and spirit, I think, still should, does have a powerful message. And that's another one. So the two ways we had in mind was, one, just by being what God wants us to be, we make a statement to the world about the nature of God, about what He wants, what's important to Him. It brings glory to Him because it ought to stand out as something very different from the way the rest of the world operates. But the second way is to truly just worship God, who we are, and then glorify Him by the acts of worship. These were some of the things, if you remember, that we talked about on Sunday morning. Somebody, if, if this were this church were ideal, and when they came um, here, they would find the whole church is here. Now, obviously, it's, people are sick, and you cannot, people are traveling. But the idea is that we are so united, we all want to be here. And so we've all gathered. We're focused on God and the things that we do. We're going to look at those acts tonight. We're paying attention to His Word. We'll talk about why that's important again tonight. We're full of the Spirit. There are different ways to think about what that means. I suggested to you, I think that means we, we come in the door with our minds, our hearts, uh, our inward person just filled to the brim with the things that matter to God. We're already showing up having thought about those all week and it just it matters to us things about forgiveness and and kindness and self-sacrifice and all those kinds of things all that God has done for us all our blessings we're just full of the things he's taught us in his word and we show up here with all the recognition of what he's done and we're full of the spirit there's an order to it a welcome um, that picture in Ephesians 3 of the diversity in believers is important, and, and, and when a church has that, it makes a more powerful message. The members are being edified, and then there's this spirit of peace, and oneness, and love. And can you tell that? Have you ever visited somewhere where you felt like these people just don't even know each other? Have you ever been a place like that? And uh, what may be a sign of that? Man, they're gone. I've, I've been in some places like, Where'd they all go? <laughs> you know, you, you, the service is over. You go to the restroom, you walk out, and 90% of the people are already gone. They're in their cars and driving off. I think that sends a message. I think it's one of the things I appreciate here about this group. There is this sense of closeness and all. People linger and stay and want to be with each other and know each other. There's a message being sent by that, and it matters, according to, to 1 Corinthians 14, even to visitors. I think that when that's the case, it glorifies God. But let's look at now. We're going to try to begin to get into these. And if we don't get through all of them, I, I, the last one is prayer. Um, if you have questions and thoughts about prayer, we don't get to it. Uh, or the one before that, just you know, talk to me. We'll try to make up for it in some other way that we didn't get to. It. All right. Um, give me a passage that talks about the Lord's Supper. First question is chapter 11. Okay. There's a great deal of information given there uh, about it. There's, there's three verses I want to focus your attention on at the beginning, which is that they partook of the Lord's Supper when the church came together. Now, can you remember Christ and think about Christ and be reminded of what He did for you on your own? Yeah, I mean, and it ought to happen. You know, read through the gospel accounts. You should be a student of that. and all. But there's something valuable about us being together and, and remembering what the Lord did. 
do you know what day? How do you, or maybe a different way to put it is, how do you know when they came together to partake of the Lord's Supper? You have a reference in Acts 20. Yeah, Acts 20 and verse 7. So I want you to turn over there. Um, there's some historical things we know about this as well. I, I've, I've been reading something about the resurrection uh, for a long time this year. And one of the interesting things that kind of pointed out through that is both in the New Testament and in the days after that, the Lord's Day became a really important deal. And, and if you look here in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, um, it, it doesn't use that phrase here. It says something else. What does it say? When did they get together? On the first day of the week. Mm-hmm. An interesting thing because, um, you know, for me, I, I, I can't help myself. I know that it's not, you know, church-wise supposed to be this way. But when I think of the first day of the week, what day do you think comes to my mind immediately? Monday. Monday starts my work week. You know, it seems like, oh, that's it. And I think even our phrasing of the fact that we have the weekend, and so that kind of sounds like Saturday and Sunday are at the end of the week. Let me reassure you that there is no question, historically, scholars, anybody, nobody questions the the idea that when the New Testament talked about the first day of the week, it meant Sunday. They understood that. And it might even be something significant. This this book kind of stressed, I found this interesting. That it's the idea of starting over even. You know, uh, Christ's resurrection from the dead, and we no longer meet on the Sabbath that's been put to, to, to rest. And now we have like this genesis, this new start, this rebirth, if you will, uh, that takes place with the resurrection of Christ and, and with the beginning of the teaching. And so they talked about the Lord's Day. And the Lord's Day meant to them the first day of the week. And Sunday became that day when they had this focus and when they gathered, Christians gathered to worship. Uh, go ahead. Is it not called the Lord's Day in Revelation chapter 1 as well? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there is a place where that, that statement or that phrase is, is, is used. It's not used here, but that, but it is used in the, in the New Testament. Now, uh, so let me keep on. I'm going to make something about that. Well, I probably should make it here before we go on. Um, so if you look at these two together, is there any place where it talks about the fact that on the first day of every week they got together and partook of the Lord's Supper? Anywhere you can think of what touches it. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. No, it doesn't say that. Oh. It says that they did it on the first day of the week. When that was the first day of the week, they come together to do this. But does it say every every first day they did that? No. Okay. I think it is important to acknowledge that it doesn't say that. And yet, nevertheless, I would stress that we, we ought to do that. Uh, for some reasons we'll kind of develop as we go through the rest of our thoughts here Uh, on the Lord's Supper. But hold that thought for a moment about the fact that it doesn't say you have to do it every first day of the week. And yet, we've chosen to do that. We might ask ourselves why we've chosen to do that here. Russ, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So can we blend that in with the the first day of the week with the um, collection? In, In this version, it says every... Yeah, well, hold, that's, that's pretty good. Hold that thought for a minute. Okay. That's a good thought. Because it's the same church where that passage is found. Yeah, Teresa's referring to chapter 16 in 1 Corinthians, and, and perhaps we'll come to that in, in a few minutes and make a connection. Because I think we might could make a connection with that. Why did they get, why, why was the Lord's Supper put together? Why did God, why did Christ initiate this and say that after his death, he would be with them. They came together, and, and that's kind of the point of 1 Corinthians 11. They begin to talk through why. What was the purpose? To proclaim his death until he comes. Okay, so one idea is to proclaim his death till he comes. That's kind of a forward look, isn't it? You think about that sometimes when we partake of the Lord's Supper, that we are, re- we are making a statement to the world that this isn't over. He's coming again. He died, but he's coming again. What else? also be a comparison to the way the Jews used the Sabbath day as their day of rest, and that wasn't just once a month or once a year, it was every Sabbath day. Yeah, that, that, that may be a reason for doing it, but I, I wanted to know first, 
why did they do it at all? So one would be to proclaim Christ till he came. Katie? Well, they were gathered together with Christ. He, he said, do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. And that's the, that is stressed again there in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. That the purpose of this, what we're doing, is to remember Christ. And so the focus is on his death. The focus is on his uh, re returning again. Uh, these things are, are really important. Or to remember Christ, the proclamation that he is returning. There's also the idea of eating unworthily. What do you think that means? Could it, could it have something to do with eating unworthy? If you have made a conscious decision to continue to, to remain in sin, but okay. still you come to services, but you made a conscious decision to remain in sin. You know, I, I think that's probably what is most often thought is that it has something to do with I'm unworthy to do that. But uh, tell me who is worthy of partaking of the Lord's Supper? Who, who's worthy of this relationship with Christ? It's really nobody, right? I think it has more to do with the manner in which you partake of it is an unworthy thing. I think you have much worse problems if you are coming and just, I'm going to stay in sin no matter what. I still think you ought to be here. Uh, hopefully that, that involvement would help to change your mind along the way. But I do think that here the idea of unworthy is the manner in which you're partaking of it. Yeah, well, we're communing with, with Christ at this point when we're partaking yeah. of the bread and right. the food and wine. If we're sitting there wondering, thinking about, oh, I have a roast in the oven. I hope it doesn't burn. You know, yeah. you're taking, you, that is doing it in an unworthy manner. You are not. You're, you're not really doing what the purpose and the idea behind the, the, the supper is. I think that's a fair statement, Steve. The New American Standard uses the words uh, self-examination or examining self. Yeah. And it talks about eating and drinking and judgment. But I just think about those two words together. You know, you're looking inwardly and you're uh, comparing your actions versus standards. Right. These are all good. Um, what, uh, there's a lot more we could say. Obviously, we're, we're, we're going to have to kind of go through these acts quickly. We're, I don't have a lot of time. It'd be nice if we could talk some about how to really make more of those moments uh, of the Lord's Supper, kind of put our minds together, ways that we could do it better as a church, ways that we could suggest to each other would be beneficial, you know, in, in our own thoughts as we are there quietly trying to remember what Christ did. Maybe even some of the, the talks and things that are done. You, I'm sure you have a number of suggestions that would be worthwhile. One thing hey, that I strikes just, me about this, go ahead, about the why we do it, it, I just want to throw out there that I see the, the memorial, I see the proclamation, and in chapter 10, the word communion is used yeah. so you know, just a moment ago. And that idea of the sharing together is part of the purpose. And it's not just, you know, happenstance that, okay, they did this when they came together. That was a part of the design of the memorial that they did when they were together. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's exactly right. My, my thought is that um, it's worth thinking about how more meaningful it is to do it in a congregation of God's people. Um, and I've wondered sometimes if it's not a worthy thought as you're there is to consider for a moment that you're sitting if you're here at Ember Hills you're sitting among 400 people who if they're all doing what they should be we're all thinking about Christ together remembering, considering the role and, and that he's played in our life and the, the benefit and value of, of being saved from our sins and um, when I think about all of you partaking of the Lord's Supper that kind of helps me uh, and, and builds me up. It, are we edified by this remembering him? Well, you should be. <laughs> well, if you really, if, you're, if your mind is in the right place, if you've listened to the things that were said beforehand, if you are meditating upon the message that God has given us that communicates about Christ, would you agree that builds you up? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that every act of worship 1 Corinthians 14 talks about all things be done for edification. 
But I thought edification, that building up, which purpose was that? That was inward. That's the inward purpose. And see, what I'm saying is that when we're all together and you're partaking of the Lord's Supper, and I know that, and I can see the respect and the honor and all being given to God, I'm built up by, by what you do, by the, the, the talking about Christ, all of those things. And yet, we're really doing it to honor Christ. And that's part of that upward purpose as well. Why every first day of the week? Well, I think, I think there's several things about that. One, when you read, when you read uh, Acts 20 and verse 7, the casual way in which it is, it is stated seems to indicate that it, that was just simply their practice. You would have known that what they were doing on the first day of the week was they were coming together for taking the Lord's Supper. Um, did they do it every single first one? Well, it's kind of hard to say, but it sure sounds as if that was kind of the natural thing. They partook of it when they came together as a church. That's 1 Corinthians 11. In 1 Corinthians 16, as Teresa was alluding to, the statement is made about giving. We're going to go to that passage when we get to that, that particular um, practice. It says on the first day of every week when you do this. That, this is what you're supposed to do in regard to that. So they were coming together every first day of the week, every Sunday. Uh, they were given instructions about when they came together, taking of the Lord's Supper. Acts 20 and verse 7 seems to indicate it was a natural thing. And here's kind of the point that I'd make about it, back to the idea of pleasing God. Can I give you an ironclad argument that you must, you ought to? If, if a church made a decision that it was going to partake of the Lord's Supper on three out of four Sundays every month, could I make an ironclad statement that that church is just wrong? I don't think I could. But I would say this, that if our goal is just to please God and honor Him, I am confident He is pleased by doing it on the first day of every single week. That's what those passages seem to be leading us to. And I know God is pleased with it. Why would we not do that is kind of more of, of the statement about it. But I think if you think about that, that makes it a little more meaningful even than just the idea, well, we do that because that's just a tradition that we always do on the first No. We want to do it. On the first day of every single week, we know it pleases God. We feel that that's the right thing to do. And I don't know why we would, I don't know what the rationale would be to choose something else. I guess it's kind of any, any questions? Go ahead, Cliff. I have in the past said that if we did not assemble upon the first day of the week, it was wrong. And it was according to the scripture to do this yep. on every first day of the week because. If it wasn't, then the Lord would have said on the first, second, or third. But he said upon the first day of the week, every week has a first day. So therefore, it alludes to the fact that it is required of us to yeah. do it every first day of the week. Yeah, so a couple of things there. I, I, I would absolutely agree with the idea that, that we have to assemble together. On the first, because I, I think that's the point of First Corinthians 16 is they were doing. I did it every single, and it wasn't talking about doing it on other days of the week. I mean, that's exclusive here as well. And, and for a lot of what you've just said, I, I, I'd be very uncomfortable not to do it on every first day. I'm still not completely convinced that it's like an, such an ironclad argument that I could not, that I could fully object to anybody who saw that differently. But I just don't understand why, why you would push for anything other than that. Because all of what you just said, I think, also kind of pushes you toward the idea. It makes sense to do it every first time. Ross, I think okay. we, we, I think we understand in the secular world. If you start a job to say you're gonna get paid on Friday, yeah, you don't say which one, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, yeah, or every one or not. Is you know, yeah, occasionally right. gonna pay me on Friday. That's right. <laughs> All right, so that, those are important thoughts. Uh, let's go to scene. Um, I'm going to show you a passage here, but I, I would appreciate if you'd open up your Bibles to Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, because uh, the, the passage is going to come up, and we're going to look at it together on the screen, but then we're going to talk about some things related to it, and the passage is going to go away. It would be nice if you're able to keep it there with you. Here's what it says. Uh, leading into the middle of verse 18, we talked before about being filled with the Spirit, Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. A lot packed into that passage. Uh, 
would you agree that the context here is of an entire group being together? If you nod your head, then I'm going to ask you then to tell me what do you, what do you see in the passage that indicates that that's the fact, that they were all together? It was a group. It's not me singing in the shower, these things. <laughs> uh, the praise for one another keeps popping up. And yeah. You do one another just to yourself. Yeah, you see that. So we're addressing one another, we're submitting to one another. All this is in the context of working within a group. Um, not just me, but with others as well. What were they singing? Three things mentioned here. What are they? Songs. 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 Spiritual songs. What was the middle one? Hymns. And then what else? Spiritual songs. Okay. You can't answer all three times in a row. That's okay. Three things, Chester says. Psalms. Psalms, I think we should have a pretty good handle on it, right? What are psalms? What, what do they mean by psalms here? Yeah, you're holding up your Bible. It's, you know, middle section there, right? Yeah. In the Old Testament, right there. Those psalms, that, that is what they sang. They, they took those. Do we ever sing a psalm? All the time. In fact, m maybe more often than we realize, because uh, I'm not as familiar with the psalms as I would like to be. I'm often surprised to find out that we're singing Psalm 38 or, or 83. If you look down in the notes down below there, and you realize, oh, this is, this is almost word for word, a psalm. Or occasionally what's interesting is that we've sung a, a song number here so many times that when I'm reading the psalms, I go, Oh, I think I know this. This is a song, you know, because you've learned it from a different way. So we do that a lot. Hymns, the word hymns, uh, the, the Greek word has to do, I, I believe, with the idea of praise. Very closely connected with the idea of a song that's going to praise God. And then spiritual songs, obviously songs about spiritual things. That's the context of, of, of what it is uh, that we are singing. So that's what's sung. Um, and I, I want to just kind of talk for a moment about the idea then of why not some instruments. You know, we, were, we were talking about visitors coming in and what they would observe. Um, we had a long list. One of the things we didn't mention, probably worthwhile if we had, do you think that have you ever had a, a friend, a neighbor, somebody, co-worker that you brought to service and they, they observe, they notice the idea? Did you talk to them ahead of time? Did you ever think about that? I, I use it on some common. And uh, in fact, I have forgotten before <laughs> that that would even be a noteworthy thing, I think, because I, you know, I've done this for so long, you, you forget about it. Why not? Why are there no instruments? And I want you to particularly think about it in the context of what we've been talking about and what we just read in that passage of your kingdom. What are some ideas? I'm going to give you some, my thoughts on it, but why do you think? We don't do that. Why don't we have animal sacrifices in a baseball diet? Okay. So that's kind of a, those are like two different things. Huh? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I thought you were going down one path. I realized you went off on two different paths. You got to the fork of the road and you went both directions. Sure. Let's come back to something. Sure. Well, a lot of that, um, a lot of that, um, those verses are talking about communion with one another yep. and to the Lord and so uh, especially like as as a musician there are songs that are not listening to the words because I want to hear the drums and the guitar and the bass and I'm distracted yep. by all of that it loses focus I think you can get lost in the acapella music as well but mm -hmm. it's it's a lot easier to stay focused on what the true purpose of what you're doing is. okay so Pam just Hang on to the idea of the true purpose of what we're doing in the idea of words. Kind of mentioned there. Words, words. I'm still not sure how to get back to, 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 to what we're not trying to do. We're not doing animal sacrifices, right? I guess that has to do with the idea of we're not doing whatever the Old Testament that they exactly did. And sometimes they did use instruments then. Right? We're not simply trying to follow that. Um, and then the other part, I'll come I think I know where you're going with that, too. It's like, hey, you just packed everything in. <laughs> and in addition to that, a lot of the argument that I hear is like, well, I have this talent. Shouldn't I be using it to glorify God? Right. I can argue that you can do so outside of the worship 
Yeah, so that, that, that's kind of an argument for the other. I want to show you some things that, that kind of explain back to the idea of, of what is our purpose? What are we trying to do? What, what are we asked to do in this singing? So a couple things I think are important. What is that? What we are doing is we are praising and thanking God. If you look at Hebrews 13 and verse 15, it talks about uh, making a sacrifice for the fruit of your lips. And it, and it puts it this way, a sacrifice of praise to God. I'm sorry, I'll go back to the beginning part of that. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So we are saying something. We are using our lips to make statements that <coughs> praise and thank God. And think about how many songs that we sing to one another and to God that are praising him and thanking him. The words are doing that. Here's the other thing. In Colossians 3 and verse 16, and that's the parallel passage. It, it is uh, constructed just like that passage in Ephesians 5, verse 18 and 19 that we just looked at. But the Ephesians 5 one, where it talked about um, addressing one another and, and being filled with the Spirit, in, he, in Colossians, it also talks about the fact that we're, we're speaking. But look at this. I'm trying to get over there. Colossians 3, verse 16 puts it this way. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. So the word is in us, and we're using the word of God to teach and admonish each other. Can you think about teaching and admonishing without words? You see the importance of words as you are trying. <coughs> and again, that's part of our focus. This is what we're being asked to do. What is the purpose of singing? Well, we're teaching and admonishing each other. We're praising. We're thanking God. Those both require words. And then there's this, this statement, and, and I ask you to stay there in Ephesians 5. If you look in Ephesians 5, in the middle part of that, it talked about the idea of making melody to the Lord with your heart. So here's what the music is. is that the melody is in your heart. And here's the point that I want to make about that is the idea of restrictive silence. We haven't talked a lot about that in this class. Maybe we, we, it would have been valuable to, along the way as we think about what the church is and how it functions. Remember when we, we looked at how does Christ lead the church? How does he do it? Through his word. Through his word. But to say that means that I have to have some idea about how to properly use that word. I have to have some idea of how God expects me to approach what his word <coughs> says. Well, here's a principle. I need you to turn over to Hebrews 7. It's very important. Here's a way in which we learn how to use that word. In Hebrews chapter 7, in beginning about verse 11, it's talking about priesthood. And this is going to be a little complicated, but we'll make it simple and then we'll read it for a moment. In the Old Law, the Old Testament, the law that Moses was given from God, it specified there would be priests. And it talked about the priest coming from what tribe? Levi. Is that? There would be priests from the tribe of Levi. Now listen here to verse 11, Hebrews 7. Hopefully you're there. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Now, the point that the writer is making is, is that we needed to have a new priesthood because the first one didn't accomplish everything that God wanted to be accomplished. God had a further plan. That priesthood, that Levitical priesthood, is what he asked for, but it wasn't going to accomplish everything. What was needed was for a priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek. And, and, and those of you who know kind of where this passage is going to go, who is going to be the priest that arose after the order of Melchizedek? Jesus Christ, yeah. Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. But there's one big problem with him being a priest. By the way, the reason why after the order of Melchizedek simply means that you are both a king and a priest. Because Christ is our king, that's Ephesians 1, 
And he's also our priest. Hebrews talks about that a lot. So here's Christ. He's after the order of Melchizedek. But there's one big problem about him being a priest. And what is it? Okay, here. Okay. Yeah, he's not from the tribe of Levi. Okay, but that shouldn't be that big of a deal. Because here's the thing. God talked about priests coming from the tribe of Levi, but he never said, not even once, that you cannot come from the tribe of Judah, and you can't come from the, the tribe of Dan. He does not say where you can't come. He doesn't say, don't do these others. He just simply says, take them from the tribe of Levi. Did it matter that he said nothing? Well, just listen. Hebrews 12, 7, verse 12. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. What? We have to change the whole law because the priesthood has been changed? Well, here's why. Verse 13. For the one of whom these things are spoken, that's Jesus, belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I missed the main part of that, that passage. Um, yeah, go all the way down. I'm sorry, all the way down to verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Uh, this is important. Sometimes the argument is, well, but God never said don't have instruments, and He, and he doesn't say that in the New Testament. But what He does say is, here's something that would please me. Make melody in your heart. Teach and admonish one another. Praise and thank me. All those things connected with work. That's what we know pleases God. Why would you do something else from that? And in this case, I would say it even stronger than, than kind of the, the points I made about meeting the first day of every week to partake of the Lord's Supper. Here, I think this silence is actually truly restricting. And it's not just a matter of you can't do something if the Bible is silent. Sometimes it's silent about things. You have to kind of figure out how to, you know, it didn't tell us what time to meet, but we know that we're supposed to meet on the first day. We, there's something you kind of have to figure out. But when it does specify something, when it says, this is what I want, the silence about everything else, I think, restricts those other things. <laughs> See the difference? <coughs> and in this case, it actually did talk about it. The music and it talked about what God wanted in singing, and I think the way that it describes it in Ephesians five and Colossians three restricts anything else. You just simply would not uh, do that singing, and therefore that that singing and singing alone is really what pleases God. It's important to think through those things because I think it's also important to understand the reason why we don't use instruments of music here is not because. This is a church of Christ. And we don't use instruments in a church of Christ. You see the difference in that? And I think sometimes that's, that's the kind of people come and they just sort of say, oh, it's church of Christ, and they won't have instruments. you got to look underneath why. Why are we not doing that? Well, it's because we want to please God. And because His Word tells us how to please Him, and we are determined that all we're going to do is just whatever it is that pleases the Lord. We can say more about that. I want to say just a few other things. Any uh, any quick questions or thoughts about singing? I just want to add that one yeah. three seventeen says whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You can't do something in the name of Jesus if he's not given a positive instruction. Yeah. So. Very good point. <coughs> here, and here, you know, you just finished giving one. Why would you then go off into something? <coughs> Some thoughts about giving. First of all, it involved every single member. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. The first day of the week when all of you are gathered. I mean, it talks about each one, each member doing this. Something that was intended to involve everybody. It was done on Sunday. In this case, it was every single Sunday, every single first day of the week. And the reason I referred you back to Acts 20, verse 7 is because, again, I think it strengthens the idea that we ought to partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Because the church was constantly getting together. But here's another thing I think is also important to recognize is that every time that you see funds being used, gathered together, and then being used in the New Testament, it was because they had a need. Now, what, what for example, in Acts, the book of Acts, were, were needs? And you remember some places where they made extraordinary efforts to make extraordinary gifts, put them at the feet of the apostles even. What was the need? Why did they do that? 
so many people there at, on Pentecost that they just couldn't take care of all of them. So there were people who just that, that, that had no other way of, of being provided for. There were some that were in need. They took care of that need by making this offering. There's some other times, too. You remember in Acts 11 when there was an issue with churches in another place? And, and the church in Antioch found out about it and realized that that was the case. And so they, on their own, made a determination. They were going to make a contribution, gather those funds, and then they sent them down to the elders in those churches to take care of them. But there was a need there. The whole thing in 1 Corinthians 16 is connected with an incident that's going on all through like Acts 19 into 20 uh, with Paul planning a trip down to Jerusalem. The end of Romans is talking about the same thing. Actually, both Corinthian letters. So when you get to 2 Corinthians and he's talking about the attitude of giving and all, it's the same situation that they're all doing. And the reason they were doing it is because there was a need down in Jerusalem and they needed to, to provide it. I'm stressing that to you because I think there's a couple of things that are important. One is, is that when we give here, we should be aware of and know that there is a need. There's a reason why we are gathering these funds together. And uh, what I'm about to say may sound a little bit shocking, but I always preface it by saying, I don't know that I can think of, particularly for a church of this nature, and the opportunities that we have, I can't picture or think about ever a, a time when we would not have a need for those funds. There's always somebody we can support that's preaching the gospel. They use money for that too. That's Acts, I mean, Philippians 4. We talked about Paul. Um, and we usually have people here who are in need too. That's not as constant, uh, but there certainly is the idea of, of worship. And then we need a place in which we can all be together. There are a number of kind of constant kind of needs. But I will say to you that if, if you can picture a church that had no way in which it could collectively spend funds, there's no reason for them to be gathering those funds. It's not like what these things are teaching is, is that you're not a real church unless you, on the first day of the week, you come together and you all make a contribution. It makes sense to do it, but only if there's a need, a way in which it would be used. And by the way, one of the more interesting things is, is from China. There are some churches in China in which... Um, they, there's no place for them to spend it. They can't, there's no way for them legally or otherwise to figure out how to provide the support of somebody who's preaching. They don't need it for where they worship. A lot of them are in houses and things, and sometimes they don't, they don't take a collection. And I don't think that's unscriptural. But here it would be. We have a need. And, and, and I think it's important for us both to do it because it fits the 1 Corinthians 16, but also for us to know why we're giving and that's why a lot of these men will make a point before we give where the funds are going, how it's helping to spread the gospel. All right, there, there were some other things in there, some other things we do. We pray, uh, we, we, we have some sermons and stuff. Y'all look disappointed. I appreciate that. Uh, if you want to talk about some of these things, I know I ran short of time, uh, but uh, and it would be good to talk about those. It's important for us to know why we do the things that we do. And that was the reason for these lessons, even though we didn't finish them. Thank you. That was the second bell, right? That was the second bell. That's the second bell. Yeah. Class dismissed. Thank you, Rush. Teacher came up short. Because no. uh, we never talk about... Um, hey, are we hey, how are you doing? Yeah. All right, Chess, yes. I'm ready. All right. I'll give you a second to get ready. Hey, Barry.